This week, I was planning to do an episode about coming out of COVID times into some kind of new normal and some tips on rebirth. But with cases spiking, again, it seems too soon for that. So instead, I wanted to share some reflections on one of the most famous Marvel villains, Thanos, who I think must have been inspired by the Greek god of death, Thanatos. Today's episode is about the creative tension between Thanatos and Eros, god of love and sex, and the dynamic balance life strikes between birth and death, creation and destruction. Whether you're a Marvel fan or not, I hope this episode offers you an opportunity to reflect on your own relationship with endings and the ways recognizing impermanence can actually help us live better lives. Welcome to Letting Grow, the podcast about one of the spiritual journey's most difficult and courageous moments, letting go of who we think we should be so we can grow into who we most deeply are. I'm your host, Claire Villarreal, and I appreciate your joining me today. start with who Thanos is and the plot of the movies that he is in. So he's in the two Avengers movies, Infinity War and Endgame. He is played very well, I might add, by Josh Brolin. And basically, these two movies are about the Infinity Stones, these six stones that at the beginning of time were somehow created and they control all of reality. And Thanos is trying in Infinity War to collect all of the Infinity Stones so that he can destroy half the population of the universe and restore balance. He's very concerned that planets are getting overpopulated and there's not enough resources to go around. There's just too much life and he wants to reduce it by half and in his mind that is going to bring balance to the universe. So long story short, in the movie Infinity War, the Avengers and many other Marvel characters try to stop Thanos, but this is a spoiler alert, they don't. In the next movie, Endgame, the superheroes go back in time and (laughs) implausibly, they get the Infinity Stones before Thanos gets them so that they're able to use them to bring back everybody Thanos just killed. So it involves quantum level physics and stuff like that. Anyway. What I want to talk about is only partly Thanos the character. I want to actually connect Thanos to a much deeper and older Western tradition of storytelling. I want to connect Thanos to Thanatos, the Greek god of death. And just for a little introduction to Thanatos, he is the son of the gods of night and darkness and the twin brother of the god of sleep. And he's also the brother of the gods of aging and suffering and some other folks that most humans are not fans of. Also, Thanatos specifically is the god of a peaceful death, not a violent death. And in classical Greek art, he can be seen um, carrying people who have died to their next life. There's a scene in, I think, Avengers Endgame where Loki says to Thanos, you'll never be a god I find that funny because Thanatos is a god. That's what entertains me. Part of the reason that Thanatos is interesting to me is that, well, obviously, first of all, it's about death and endings, and uh, that is just of interest to me. But also, Sigmund Freud, one of the founders of modern psychology, he had this idea that in human psyches, the two powers or the two drives of Eros and Thanatos are sort of intention. Eros is the Greek god of love and sex and erotic energy. Often we think of it as being um, like sexual energy, but more broadly, it really just means the life force, the drive toward creativity. And that Freud felt was intention with this drive toward Thanatos or a self-destructive urge in the human psyche. 
And I should just say, this has been disputed. There's not necessarily like a biological basis for this idea of like this drive toward Thanatos in the way that there is toward Eros, because obviously our species <laughs> reproduces on the basis of Eros. So that kind of drives evolution. And uh, we do have a biological drive in the direction of Eros, but we don't have a biological drive necessarily in the direction of Thanatos. So what I want to talk about is not necessarily the balance of Eros and Thanatos in the context of just the human psyche, but I actually want to talk about it more broadly in the context of nature and culture and society and just life. So it's pretty easy to see that at least in certain realms, Eros has to be balanced by Thanatos. So like if you think about plants, when a tree falls in the forest and it begins to decompose and break down, it's basically fertilizing the soil so that the next generation of trees can grow. It's the reason that we plow under old crops to, to help put the nutrients from those plants back into the soil so that the next generation of crops can grow. If you think about countries with a high birth rate, sometimes they end up with a lot of youth unemployment because there are just more young people coming into the labor market than there are old people aging out of the labor market. Or if you think again about, you know, human biology, just think about our own digestive systems. Like we take in food and we excrete poop. And when we poop out the old food that we've already, you know, taken in as many nutrients from it as possible, when we poop that out, we're making space for the next batch of food that's going to come down the pipe. Like there's, there's just a constant flow of growth and death or endings. In order to sustain an organism, there has to be the in-breath and there has to be the out-breath. There has to be the Eros, there has to be the Thanatos, and if there's not both, we get out of balance. Part of the reason that I find Thanos so interesting as a villain is that I feel he's really symptomatic of North American or like postmodern Western culture where we've gone all in on Eros, but we've lost our relationship with Thanatos. And because we don't have a relationship with Thanatos, like the sacred aspect of endings or of death, instead we get Thanos, who's just about destruction and endings, and he's a, he's a distorted image of what death is. So if you're thinking, yeah, Claire, but that's crazy because like everybody's afraid of death, right? I mean, it's true. It's not like there's a culture where people are like, oh, we're all gonna die, that's fabulous. But there are cultures... And, and this is why I say this is like Thanos is like emblematic of modern Western culture or even postmodern Western culture, because in pre-modern culture, you know, you have, for instance, the Middle Ages in which people experienced the Black Plague and you had this Catholic tradition of remembering death, reflecting on death and, and having really that mindfulness of death and the inevitability of it as a kind of whetstone so that we can sharpen our appreciation of life and not forget to live because death could be just around the corner. In our society, it just feels like we've mastered so many technological capabilities that allow us to live longer, that allow us to have safer childbirth, that allow us not to die of like really simple infections. And on top of that, they allow us to produce way more food and to, to have the earth and the planet sustain way more humans than we could without all this technology to help us. And it just seems like if any, if any culture in the history of humanity has really mastered Eros and has been able to get away from Thanos, it's us. And yet... <laughs> Here we are, you know, we're in a time of COVID, we're in a time of climate crisis, we're in a time when all these threats really are, are just popping back up, these, these ways that we can die at any time. And in more traditional societies, and again, I'll go back to Tibetan cultures, because that's the one that I've studied the most and, and am the most familiar with. It's not like they were looking forward to dying. I mean, everybody 
even people really practicing the death process and reflecting on what happens at the time of death and the, the bardo states that we go through, they weren't reflecting on those bardo states because they were eager to get in there and die. They were reflecting on the bardo states because that tells you who you are right now. Like we have Buddha nature and that comes through clearly in these transitional states during the death process. Again, like other cultures, you know, I've been talking about ancient Greece, they had the the mystery traditions, the, you know, Eleusinian mysteries. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, but this tradition that that there's a way to die and that there's a way to end up in a state of paradise rather than just, you know, seeing death as ceasing to exist. I know I've mentioned this before, but but one really beautiful custom from Japan is that when ceramics break, people will actually fix them with gold. So there's this sense of sort of honoring these ruptures in ordinary life, honoring what could have been the end of a vessel, and instead transforming that into just the next stage of the lifetime of that vessel and recognizing the beauty of it and even highlighting those broken places with gold. I just feel like that's another way of of appreciating the bitter and the sweet in life, of of making art out of moments of transition and moments of sadness and loss. Hi friends, want to join the Letting Grow tribe? I'll be starting a bi-weekly newsletter in early 2021 with links to articles, YouTube videos, other podcasts, and basically the best of the rebirth content I've come across lately. Some examples of the kinds of things I want to share with you include a snap judgment story about a bull who seemed to be the reincarnation of another bull, a viral article about the creepy things kids say, but some of them 100% seem to refer to previous lives and some excerpts from the book I'm writing now about the lessons Tibetan Buddhist teachings on life and death offer to those of us going through transitions. Spoiler alert, that's all of us. Best of all, if you're subscribed, you'll get links to join free live video calls with me and other subscribers every couple of months. So pause this episode now, find the newsletter sign up link in the show notes and join your tribe. So basically, if you're thinking everybody fears death, why are we so strange? Um, I just want to say we are very atypical in terms of all of human culture uh, throughout history, but also even now in, in different cultures on this planet. It is possible to have a very different type of relationship with death, with endings, with change. That's kind of why I'm doing this podcast, because I think... Just educating ourselves on what happens after we die, you know, reading their research on it or listening to a podcast with a research on it, which is going to be season number two, which will be coming hopefully at some point over the summer. So there's just a lot we can do to, to make friends with Thanatos instead of being afraid of it and sort of distorting the way we think of death and endings and ending up with Thanos instead of Thanatos. Okay. That was a long rant. I'm going to go on and talk about the theme of balance. So I want to talk about Thanos and balance, and then I want to talk about Thanatos and balance. So Thanos wants to restore balance to the universe by eliminating half of all life. And I, I just find this really interesting. Like This is clearly a villain coming from an age of climate crisis. Thanos' motivation for wanting to restore balance is that when a world gets overpopulated, as we can see around us, the resources just aren't there anymore to support the next generations in, in, the, in the type of lifestyle that we are enjoying. We can see that with climate change, global warming, rising sea levels, but also just food supply and even water. Fresh water supply is going to be a real issue going forward in a lot of places. So it's understandable why Thanos has this drive to restore balance. But the problem is that destroying half of all life doesn't really solve that problem because Eros and Thanatos are still not balanced. 
if we were to lose half the human population to COVID, which fortunately is not likely to happen at all, but if we were to lose half the human population, we would just repopulate <laughs> because we still have the technology. We still are going to have a higher reproductive rate than death rate. So it just, it doesn't solve the underlying issue of this what should be a creative tension between Eros and Thanatos, but it's like in, in our culture, Eros has just metastasized and taken over and, and a, a real relationship with Thanatos is difficult to come by. The other point I want to make about Thanos and what I think is wrong with his approach is that Thanos wants to control what happens. He, he actively wants to destroy half of all life. Thanatos, the way I read this figure from Greek mythology, is more about accepting that death happens to us all and being able to have a graceful transition into what comes next. So Thanos kind of wants to like boost <laughs> the death side of the equation, but without the appreciation that Thanatos is also part of the natural order, that Thanos, Thanatos is something we have to relax into. It's not something we control. Also, just to underscore this point again, Thanos actively wants to kill half the universe's population. The traditions, like the Greek mystery traditions or Tibetan Buddhism or so many traditional cultures, the traditions that have a more healthy relationship with Thanatos are not looking to die. They're not actively looking to destroy themselves and others. They're actually just looking to, to be prepared for the inevitable. So to wrap things up, what can we learn about our relationship with death as a culture from these two movies, Infinity War and Endgame? My, one of my main takeaways from these two movies is that death really is the ultimate fear-inspiring fact of life. It's, the, it's a great basis for like the ultimate villain for a superhero movie because you cannot escape Thanatos. No one escapes Thanatos, even in Greek mythology. Sisyphus, I was Googling Thanatos earlier, Sisyphus tricks Thanatos for a while and traps him in the chains that were supposed to go around Sisyphus, but eventually even Sisyphus gets his due and dies. So, like, if you want an invincible supervillain, I mean, come on, it's Thanatos. It's got to be Thanatos. So it's funny that in the end of this series, the Avengers and the superheroes do beat Thanos. But I think this is because... It's Thanos, not Thanatos. They can defeat a distortion of this drive toward death. They can defeat someone who only embodies the destructive aspect of death, not death as a sacred moment, death being in a sort of sacred tension with Eros. So really, the person we need to have a relationship with, if we want Eros to flourish, is not Thanos, but Thanatos. So not the distortion of death that's just about destruction, but really recognizing that the loss of the old makes room for the new. It's true within our own lives. It's part of the spiritual growth process. No one grows spiritually without losing who they were. And it's painful, but it's also the most rewarding thing I can think of. So at the end of the day, the real mistake, I think, is taking Thanatos to be something like Thanos, mistaking the natural process of death, the natural process of endings, of change, which is part of growth. If there were no death, evolution would never happen. Eros, Thanatos, it's all tied together in one kind of sacred relationship. So when we think of death only as destruction and endings, and we miss the rest of the context, we've turned Thanatos, a sacred god, into Thanos, a Marvel villain. <laughs> so I hope this maybe sparked some thoughts for you about <laughs> Thanos and the Avengers movies. There's a lot of wisdom in there. There's lots more stuff we could talk about, but that's probably good for one day. 
And I hope also that it's introduced you to Thanatos and his relationship with Eros and the way that those two forces, if they're really in their proper creative tension in our own lives, can bring us growth and transformation and just the beauty of life. The beauty of life that we can't see if we don't also recognize death. Thanks for coming along for today's exploration of the process of letting grow. If you found this episode helpful, please share it. And subscribe now so you're always in the loop. For links to more content related to today's episode, please see the show notes. See you again next week.